Man, I had no idea how long I was going to put off this trilogy review for. And you know what? I really shouldn't have. I very rarely, oh great upon, ha 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 ha, got to talk about the actual Donkey Kong Country Super Nintendo games and why I love them so much, with one of them being my favorite of the three. But first, a little backstory about DK's revival. Way back in the early 90s, former relatively unknown UK developer Rare created a special graphics chip that allowed the use of CGI 3D models to be used as sprites using a tech demo of a boxer. And Nintendo, who at that moment was going around the globe looking for companies who showed great potential to add to their collection, I mean team, visited Rare, saw the demo, was very impressed, and purchased 49% of the company. Not enough to become a first party company, but enough to make their games exclusive to Nintendo. Rare received a lot of cash to better improve the quality of the 3D models, and when they were deciding on what game to make, designer and writer Greg Miles wanted to make a platformer inspired by Mario 3 that would be visually appealing, and asked if they could make a game based on the long-forgotten character, Donkey Kong. Up to this point, DK was left behind in the past, while Mario became the mascot of Nintendo. DK would finally get his chance to shine. Oh wait, no he wouldn't, because DK became the character known as Cranky Kong, so who is this? Why, it's his son! No wait, his grandson, DK Jr. How do we know that? The Donkey Kong who fought that epic battle with Mario was this guy's grandfather. Any other questions? How can DK be next to himself in Mario Tennis? Oh, that's just a space-time continuum paradox, don't worry about it. So now DK Jr. takes his grandfather's name, and Ty, went through a time skip so Mario would be unaffected and was used in a game that had the most impressive graphics the world had ever seen, making it a landmark in gaming history. But as any self-respecting gamer will tell you, looks aren't everything. But man, did it get a lot of attention! I remember hearing about this game from a commercial and I couldn't believe what I saw! My family rented it, we beat it, and I wanted it for Christmas that year because, well, I wanted that game because I loved playing it! And with that out of the way, let's dive into the actual game. <laughs> One dark and stormy night, the Kremlins came to DK Island, yeah, clever name, stole DK's banana horde, and put his best little buddy Diddy in a barrel before he could warn DK. Now Donkey Kong will go across this island to reclaim his banana stash and turn the Kremlings into his new matching handbags. Glad that didn't take five minutes to explain, because now it's on like... Ugh. DKC plays like many other great traditional 2D platformers, just get from point A to point B. If you take a hit, you'll die! Unless you have either Diddy or DK right behind you. If you lose either one of them, you can easily get them back by picking up and breaking a barrel that says DK on them. And the DK on the barrel can mean either Diddy Kong or Donkey Kong! Brilliant! If you want, you can have them tag the other Kong to be the leader. There really isn't that much of a difference between the two. They can both run and jump and climb and do an attack, and if you do an attack over a ledge and then jump, you'll do a super jump to reach other areas or hard to reach items. Diddy is a little faster while DK can do a ground pound, which really isn't that big of a deal in this game, and I've only gotten used out of it in the first cave level. DK holds a barrel over his head, while Diddy puts it in front of him giving a little extra protection, and it makes it easier trying to find all the bonus rooms. While on the subject of barrels, these star barrels are your checkpoints should you meet a nasty end, and you'll meet a lot of them. The steel barrels keep on rolling when thrown, and you can get on top of them for a ride and then pick it up and use it again. Multipurpose! These are these self-explanatory TNT barrels, and then you have the plain old regular barrels. That was a little underwhelming, so let's go over the extra help you'll get like your animal buddies. The most popular one is Rambi the Rhino, your destructive powerhouse. Unguard the Swordfish, aka Water Rambi, who also makes the swimming parts as easy as the frog suit from Mario 3. Winky the Toad, your slippery jumper, and Espresso the Ostrich, your slow descension. Oh, and there's also Squawks, who shows up for one level, and if you can't handle quick bright flashes, do not turn around. On the map, you'll find the other members of the Kong family, like Kong. Why was I bleeped? Isn't a bad word. What's wrong with saying who was the idiot that allowed that to happen? <sighs> Whatever, she'll save your game. Funky Kong will fly you around the island to places you've already been to, and has a theme that matches his name. And finally, the original DK himself, Cranky Kong, who gives advice and a whooping. Oh right, the other things in the levels. Bananas are basically your coins, rings, or anything else you collect that gives you an extra life when you collect a hundred of them. Balloons will automatically give you an extra life. Collecting the letters K-O-N-N-G will also give you an extra life. And collecting three of the same animal tokens lets you go to a bonus room with the animal that's on the token where you can get some extra lives. Find that hidden multiplier. There are also other bonus rooms hidden throughout the levels that can earn you either more bananas or one-ups. It may sound like the game is just throwing extra lives your way, but in all honesty, You'll be needing a lot of them! 
There is a total of six worlds in the final boss. Each world has a theme. Jungle, mines, forests, snowtop mountains, industrial wasteland, and caverns. However, not every level in the world fits that theme, such as underwater, temples, and the forest moon of Endor. And they only make sense if you look at the map. Personally, I like it since it makes the areas less predictable, and if every level in that area looked the same, it would feel very tedious and boring to me. And while I'm on the subject of levels, I would like to point out that nearly every level is used about three to four times, with a few exceptions, but they usually have a different coloring to them, and usually a gimmick. No, you know what? Gimmick kind of devalues them. They fit the level all too well and are very well thought out, so I guess you could call them themes or even set pieces. It makes them all feel very unique and, dare I say, fresh from one another. I mean, you're certainly not going to confuse one level for another, because you'll always remember that they did something special or something different. The levels themselves have a lot of varieties, such as traditional platforming, never drowning water levels, exciting minecarts, obnoxious barrel blasts, and those one time themes I mentioned earlier, such as slippery ropes, lights on, lights off, stop and go creatures, and tanked up trouble. Each level environment gets its own soundtrack. For example, treetop village levels have the soundtrack Treetop Rock. Underwater levels have aquatic ambience, and the caves put me to sleep. Once you've conquered, yes I went there, the levels in the world, you'll encounter a boss that is put bluntly, easy, predictable, and really aren't even worth talking about, so let's move on to the next part. So what do I enjoy about DKC? Well, I'd say the two biggest factors are the difficulty and variety. It never feels like two levels play exactly the same, even if they have the same background and music. You can expect the next level to be different from what you've just played. Even if they use a previous theme like minecarts or barrel blasts, they don't feel the same as before. The game knows how to keep it fresh and challenging. In fact, nearly 20 years later, it can still give me a game over. Well, a few times it's due to the fact that they throw an obstacle in your way and you can't react to it in time. But other than that, the deaths you may encounter are mostly your fault. The soundtrack for the game is... Well, I like a majority of it. The ones I like are the ones that have very strong, noticeable tunes and rhythms, such as Forest Frenzy, Treetop Rock, Fear Factory, the bonus rooms, the boss battles including the final boss battle, Cranky and Funky's theme, the minecart levels, and Ice Cave Chant. I do understand that the others help give it an atmospheric vibe, and when they hit their true potential, it is a thing of beauty to listen to. Yes, I am also referring to aquatic ambience as well. Once it finally gets going, it definitely shows its charm. Speaking of which, that is the one thing this game doesn't get enough credit for. A sense of charm. This was state-of-the-art graphics back then, top of the line. I know that's hard to believe from what we have today, but it's the truth. That's not the charm, however. What is the charm is that they went so far to give the characters little animations that isn't just running, jumping, or getting hit. They could have made it as simple as could be, and people would still think it was impressive. But look a little closer. Look at how he reacts when he's near a ledge. Or seeing Diddy just take off his hat and scratch his head. Even the level names themselves have a little bit of charm to them. We take that stuff for granted these days and don't even notice how the Pokemon trainer in X and Y has idle animations for the first time in the handheld RPG series. Back then, the only characters I can think of that did that were Sonic the Hedgehog and Earthworm Jim. I mean, the most memorable Mario expressions I can remember at that time was when he did his Oh no, I died! or Peace out expressions. It seemed like that was the furthest they ever did with him until Mario 64, from what I can remember anyway. Back then, it was kind of rare, ugh, there's that word again, to see characters actually give off a form of personality. Look at how happy they are when they clear a stage. Look at how mad or disappointed they are when they lose a bonus round. Even the enemies give off a sense of personality. Every different kind of enemy gave off a different sound effect from when they got beaten up. It's a little layer of depth that could go right over the heads of many players today, but back then, it's kind of hard not to notice it. Which only confuses me as to why I don't really hear anyone else talk about it that much, or even at all. And while it can be pretty tedious checking every wall in Bottomless Pit, I still feel a little joy when I find the bonus stages. Which actually brings me to one of the biggest problems I have with the game. <laughs> Finding every secret bonus room in the game gets you 101% completion next to your save file, and Cranky saying, good job. That sounds very unimpressive and very unsatisfying. I personally never got the total completion score because I didn't see a big payoff for it. No extra levels, no unlockables, nothing that adds anything to the gameplay, just something I can watch on YouTube. It didn't give me a whole incentive to come back and play some more, besides playing through the game again just for the heck of it. Yeah, there's a two-player mode, but it's not what it looks like. Only one person plays at a time. One player is DK, and the other is Diddy, and you only play if the other person switches, which in my case, never happened, or if they get hit and run away. 
The other two player mode lets you see who can beat the game first, but once again, it's not at the same time and makes it more fun to just play by myself. <laughs> Overall, Donkey Kong Country was an impressive platformer that ended up selling over 8 million copies for the Super Nintendo, becoming the second best seller for the system. Some say that Donkey Kong Country alone was the reason Nintendo eventually won the 16-bit console war. But without a source, it's just a myth. As is expected from a big blockbuster title, a sequel would be in order, but I couldn't believe that they would come up with one in just a year! For as advanced as this game looked, I never thought they could make a sequel in about 365 days! The first time I heard about it was in a screenshot of EGM Magazine. I couldn't believe it! Another installment to a game I couldn't stop playing was coming out before the end of the year?! It came out on November 20th, 1995. Unfortunately, I had no idea at that time when it actually came out, and I ended up getting it around New Year's Eve, and could not wait to spend the rest of my Christmas vacation playing Diddy's Conquest! Oh look, another P.U.N. They love to do that. One day, DK is relaxing while Diddy is playing with his girlfriend, Dixie Kong. I assume this is like Tiny Toons and they have no relation, right? Well, DK was enjoying a pleasant day until pirates came and kidnapped him. They leave a ransom note saying, Hand over your banana so you'll never see DK again! <laughs> Although the game's note just says, You'll never see him again! <laughs> Diddy takes it upon himself to rescue his friend, and Dixie decides to come along, while all the older Kong members set up shop to help them while the kids take on a journey to a dangerous pirate island to get their friend back. Kids, always doing a grown-up's job. The gameplay is identical to the first game in the sense that it's a 2D platformer asking you to get to the goal at the end of the level and rock out! Of course, it wouldn't be much fun if there weren't any new additions and improvements from the first game, and there's plenty of them! Most notably, the new character, Dixie Kong. She uses her hair to pick up barrels and throw them, and she twirls it like a helicopter to attack and float downward, making some of the most difficult platforming parts and large gaps a thing to laugh at. They've also given Diddy and Dixie a new team-up move, where you can pick up the other Kong and use them as a weapon or to get to higher areas or items that are out of range. And there's also some barrels that can only be used by Diddy or Dixie. And because Dixie starts with a D, the DK barrels still mean the same for both. Genius! Other new additions include three different types of coins, new and old animal buddies, and new and old Kongs. For coins, there are the basic banana coins that act as currency, the DK hero coins that are hidden in every level and are used to test how good of a gamer you are, with 40 being the total amount, and the creme coins that are collected for clearing the bonus stages and beating the bosses. For animal buddies, Rambi and Ungar return with a new charge move, but Winky and Expresso do not reappear. Squawks finally ditches the light and will now carry you and spit out nuts. Squats, you've graduated from flashlight to awesomeness! Be proud! Squitter the Spider, who is easily the best new animal buddy, shoots webs that can be fired straight, upwards, downwards, and webs that act as platforms. Eat your heart out, Cloud Mushroom from Galaxy 2! Ratley, on the other hand, is pretty much a pogo stick. And then we have two animal buddies that won't give you a piggyback ride. Glimmer takes up Squawk's role from the first game by lighting the way in this one underwater level, and Clapper the thermostat allows you to cool hot water or freeze it to ice so you can run on it. In certain levels, you'll jump into a barrel that has a picture of an animal buddy on it, which will transform you into that animal. There's not much of a difference, except you don't get an extra hit, but you don't have to chase the animal buddy down if you get hit. Then you have the Kong family on the overworld map yet again. Cranky and Funky return and offer their usual services this time but now it costs you some banana coins for first-time users. Cranky's wife, Winkly, steps in, who runs a school that gives information that you should already be aware of, so don't purchase them, and can save your game. First time in a world, it's free. Every other time costs you two coins. And I don't know who wrote those answers on the board, but I can guess they probably won't get very far in life. And then there's Swanky Kong, who runs a trivia game show. Pay him some bananas to win extra lives, but if you get a question wrong, you'll have to pay to play again. That takes care of that. Oh wait, there's this Kremlin Clubba. You have to pay him 15 Krem coins to use this barrel that takes you to an unlockable and very difficult level. And whatever you do, don't try to fight him. <laughs> the sequel is structured very much like the first game. See your levels on a map, go there, clear them all, beat the boss, and repeat. In a similar manner to the first game, every level is seen three times except for the roller coaster level that shows up twice, and the only haunted hallway level. Although when you add those up, you still get three minecartish levels. I don't know exactly what you want to call that. The areas you'll encounter this time are pirate ships, inside sunken pirate ships, sails of the pirate ship, wait, 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 don't jump to conclusions, yes, the enemies are very piratish, but that's about it for the pirate makeover and levels. The other stages are lava pits, mining caves, swamps, bramble levels, the two different minecartish levels, hazy forests, Ice Caverns, 
castle dungeon-like sections, and the jungle, but only in the Lost World. On par with the first game, the levels change either with the color, challenges, or even the background differences, such as the second pirate ship level where the sun sets as you get closer to the goal, or the sails with the rising water and the ferocious piranha who eats anyone brave or foolish enough to step in unless they're protected. Using the wind to get around in the mine cavern, a death race in the bramble levels, the freaking elevator of peril, and the you-know-what that lurks in this honeycomb level. Tell me that didn't scare the bananas out of you the first time you encountered it. Go ahead and tell me it didn't, so I know who the liars are. I could go on and on, but it would be better to experience this yourself. Although I do want to ask, what's up with those trees in the forests? Every time I pass by them, I keep thinking smoke is going to show his face, and the word toasty will be said if I kill an enemy. And of course, there are the bosses. Still not that hard to take down, but I do feel that they have beefed up their game just a little from the first installment. And you gotta love how Diddy or Dixie just rock out after they beat him up. Same thing for clearing a level if you hit the target with enough force to get a prize. It's easy to say the charm from the first game is present in this one, if not a little more noticeable. Sure, they don't freak out near a ledge anymore, but look at how they switch between each other. Or their idle animations. Even when they're just hanging on honey walls, you can see Dixie tasting them. Rare really knew how to put some charm into their games. <laughs> There's no better way for me to say this. I love this game! I love just about everything that was programmed into it. The way the levels never feel the same, like the first game, the little surprises, the new animal buddies, the bonus stage, the collectibles, the improvements, the music. Dear Lord, this music is awe-inspiring and just about every possible positive definition you could give. I'm not even going to waste time making a negatives part for this game because anything bad I have to say about it is pathetic nitpicks that couldn't come close to lowering the game's recommendation level. Actually, I probably should say them just so I won't be asked what they were a thousand times in the comments. I'm not one for the first Bramble level, as I'm not a big fan of waiting for the barrels to line up for the majority of the stage. Ratley sucks when compared to the other ABs, as he only jumps higher, and his charge jump takes way too long to get going. At least he can do a super jump of his own, and turning the game off will reset your banana coin count and lives. That's it. No, I won't talk about Animal Antics win section, because I hate it for the right reasons. It's a very difficult challenge that feels unfair, but really it's up to the ability of the player to adapt to the changing winds. For all the praise I've given, there are some personal things with me in this game. For one, this game was also in my dreams a number of times, whether it was for an unlockable boss or finding all the secrets in the game. This was the first time a game was ever in my dreams, but beyond that, it's the very sentimental value I have with it. Friendship. No, I'm not talking about how Diddy and Dixie are trying to save DK. You see, back when the game first came out, I knew that my best friend was going to be moving away the next year. He had the game as well, and we wanted to work together to find every Krim coin and DK hero coin in the game. Back then, the internet wasn't a well-known thing, and gaming sites weren't exactly common knowledge for those who played video games. Heck, the term gamer didn't even exist yet! We also didn't know what a strategy guide was, as we had never heard of them. It was just me and my friend and sometimes my older brother, searching every wall, dropping into numerous bottomless pits for the hopes of fighting a DK hero coin and a bonus room barrel, which were added as well as carrying every cannonball into a cannon to also be shot into a bonus room, where we had to either collect all the stars, find the coin, or destroy the ball! Every time one of us found something, we would tell the other. This went on for months, and our total was... 38 DK hero coins out of 40, and 74 creme coins out of 75. Somehow, there was one creme coin that got away from us, which prevented us from getting the last two DK hero coins. And we had no clue where it was. On the GBA port, the game does tell you how many bonus rooms there are in a level, and how many you found in them. I had wished that the original game did something like that, and then fellow YouTube user Antu92 informed me a few years ago that if a stage has an exclamation mark next to it, it means you found them all in that level. After hearing that, I wanted to cry! Had I had known that back then, we might have found them all instead of knowing that there was one coin mocking us! Well, at least there was that code for 75 Kren coins that I didn't know about until he moved away. I'm just gonna go cry in the corner for a little bit. <laughs> to me, Donkey Kong Country 2 will always be the king of 2D platformers in terms of varied level designs, incredible music, and wanting to prove yourself as a gaming legend. And with two successful games for the Super Nintendo, Rare decides to go for the hat trick and release Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie's Double Trouble on November 22nd, 1996. 
Unfortunately, I did not pick this one up for the Super Nintendo, as around the time it came out, I, much like everyone else in the game even knew it, was trying to save up for the Nintendo 64. As the years went by, I had heard that the game wasn't as good as the first two, so I set my expectations for it rather low and didn't even think of picking it up when it was available for the Wii's Virtual Console. But once Donkey Kong Country Returns was announced, I decided to download it because... it felt like I had to, you know? To experience the whole trilogy for myself and to have a warm-up for when Returns was released. Good thing I downloaded it when I could, because all the Donkey Kong Country games were taken down from the Virtual Console for an unknown reason back in November 2012. Honestly, Nintendo, either give us a reason for this or put them back up there. Otherwise, it just looks so dumb. So, what's the story this time? Shortened to the point, DK and Diddy are missing, and Dixie goes to an island where she believes they are and teams up with Kitty Kong to go looking for them. Short, simple, stupid. Whatever gets me to the gameplay faster, I couldn't care less in this situation. And the object is pretty much the same as the first two games, so let's talk about new things and changes. Kitty can hold barrels in front of him, throw Dixie Kong up to higher places, and can jump on water when done correctly. Also, if Dixie throws Kitty, he won't go that far, but he can open up holes in the floor to reach bonuses. So the dynamic of having two characters with subtle differences remains intact. But since Kitty starts with a K, the DK Burrow thing no longer feels special for its initials. Lame. Banana coins are replaced with bear coins, creme coins are replaced with golden coins, and the DK Hero coins are still there, but are now protected by coin with a K. To get it, you have to hit him in the back with a steel barrel that was absent from DKC2, and can be ridden on top of again like in DKC1. Sometimes it's easy, and other times, you will want to bang your head against a wall! And that's when he's not hidden somewhere in the stage. Your animal buddies like On Guard, Squitter, and Squawks can still be counted on while Ratley disappeared, which is good news for me, but uh, they took out the fire flower of Donkey Kong Country. By that I mean Rambi. Instead, you get Ellie the Elephant, which almost feels like a replacement, but not as much fun. Oh sure, Ellie has a lot of uses, like sucking, lol, and shooting water, but come across a rat, and watch her freak out, and not in a good way. Good luck on this stage with Ellie. You'll need it. Another little animal buddy is Perry, who can only grab things that are too far above your head to reach, and another squawk who can't spit out nuts, but can pick up barrels and drop them. Oh. Okay, so on this island you'll find Funky, who is now a mechanic and will enhance your boat to help you reach new areas once you've defeated a boss that has an item. Winkly now hangs out in a cave, but will save your game for no cost. Swanky has you play against cranky and carnival style throwing games, but that will cost you two coins each time. And then we have the Bear Brothers, whose names all start with the letter B. They kind of have a trading sequence going on in the game, but it's really only for unlocking some of the caves that have you play a game of Simon, and when you beat it, it frees a banana bird. No, there's nothing wrong with your ears, I said banana bird. What do they do? Well, collect all the banana birds and all the golden coins to unlock levels in the not-so-secret world, beat all of them in the game, and collect every DK hero coin, and you'll get a different ending. Yeah, now it's three things you have to collect to get an extra ending this time. In the last one, each collectible had a different reason for being collected, and you didn't need all the DK hero coins to get the extra ending, so this just seemed kind of lazy to me. This time you'll go through... Well, wow, there's a lot here. Boardwalks, mills, snow-covered villages, hollowed-out trees, forests, underwater again, waterfalls, factories, caverns, cliffs, pipelines, and good old-fashioned jungles. And once again, the tradition of making every level feel different is intact. Reverse controls, lightning strikes, giant saws, forest race, etc. The challenge factor is alive and well, and lives up to the tradition that the series became known for. The levels are still varied and different enough from each other to keep the game from being repetitive. You are also able to swim around in the water in the overworld, and doing so with certain patterns may reveal something hidden. The bosses have definitely had the biggest upgrade this time, as they have given me quite a bit of trouble to deliver the final blow. Not the first boss, no, that's a joke. But this boss and this boss have always given me a little extra pain and frustration. The levels are still a pleasure to play through, and Dixie and Kitty have their individual uses. However, the rest of the game feels like a downgrade from the previous installments. To address the elephant in the room, the music is by far the weakest of the trilogy. I can't even pick out a track I like from the game, except for maybe the bonus room in the jungle. Music is of personal taste, but it's hard to find anyone that liked this over DKC2's glorious soundtrack. In fact, I've heard that the GBA port of this game, they actually redid the music entirely! That says something. The background also kind of bothers me. Sure, it looks decent, but it doesn't do much to make it pop out. Here is the cave level, and here is the mine level from DKC2. 
Notice there's a lot more detail and color here. They could have added some dripping water from the ceiling, or maybe even a little waterfall in the background. They definitely have a natural beauty to them, but the extra detail and features appear to be absent. The levels are still fun, but the soundtrack and lack of stellar visuals is what I find to be the game's biggest shortcomings. I also see a lack of personality in the characters. They aren't excited or scared anymore, and besides the idle animations and switching, the only noticeable charm is Kitty raising his eyes when he clears a bonus stage. Oh, and the whole Bear Brothers thing? Yeah, that really wasn't necessary in the long run. It just felt pointless and tacked on. I think it's time to finally wrap everything up. As a trilogy, the Donkey Kong Country game stand is some of the best 2D platformers you may ever play. Each level usually has a new spin on things and is very identifiable to those who have played it. They have a challenge factor that can keep you coming back for more, which keeps them from never getting old. These games are classics, though I would have to say that in my honest opinion, the second one gets everything right. Level design, soundtrack, replay value, and additions. If you can only play one of them, Diddy's Conquest is the one to experience. On the flip side, it's hard to say which is the weakest one. I mean, I think the first DKC game was the weakest just because of its replay value, even though DKC 3 felt like a few steps back in terms of presentation and charm. But you should definitely pick them all up if you get the chance. DKC 2 is so good, I wish I could give it a higher recommendation level compared to the other two games, just to give a clear example of how good it is compared to them. But in all honesty, they're all really good games themselves, so it wouldn't be fair. My recommendation is the same for all of them. A 5 out of 5. They are great games to add to your collection. How about some extra tips and neat insight into the games while the credits roll on by? There are plenty of shortcuts in DKC and DKC2. However, the levels in the first two worlds in DKC2 have at least one shortcut that will take you to a room with an exclamation mark made out of bananas, then right to the goalpost. If you're wondering how to get 102% in DKC2, and not just 100%, I'm not entirely sure, but I think if you collect all the Krim coins, DK Hero coins get the cheat at the first level, and I think if you beat the game in under 4 hours, you'll get that extra 2%. Of course, I could be wrong, but I know that's how I got 102% when compared to just 100%. I'll only bring this up for a fact. The GBA version of DKC2 has extra minigames and things to collect like golden ostrich feathers, photos, and an extra boss for that one part of the game. Still, I prefer the original version as the GBA port felt like it tried to tack on as many things as possible in an effort to just fatten the game up. Donkey Kong Country had a special cartridge made for competitions that was just levels in random order. I don't have it since it's very rare. Ah, oh, there's that pun again! Go away! But I thought I should bring it up just for the information. Just a heads up guys, there's a little spoiler coming, but I really wanted to do this joke, so close your eyes until the video suggestions are ready if you don't want to see it. Fair warning, not my fault now. And it feels so good to finally finish this trilogy review. And we're still not done with Tropical Freeze Week yet. Starting from the top left, you'll see the Tropical Freeze edition of music tracks for the next Smash. The 15 minute challenge was replaced with my list of the 5 hardest DKC Super Nintendo Lost World levels, my 10 personal favorite levels from Tropical Freeze, and the review for Tropical Freeze itself. I really had to pull in overtime for this week, which is why I keep saying the total view count for all the videos needs to be 100,000 views by the end of March in order for me to do another week like this, but for another series. So let's see if all the hard work will make a sequel. Then we'll see what series it might be next. And with that in mind, I'll see you guys soon with a review for Tropical Freeze! Later, everyone!